Any construction project will involve the use of major plant and machinery, working at heights, working with dangerous energy sources like electricity or gas, and other activities. These activities have the potential to result in injury or fatalities for workers or members of the public. It is our job to manage these activities to eliminate or at least minimize the risk of this happening. Construction Health and Safety Risk Management covers the process of managing construction activities to eliminate or minimize as far as reasonably possible the risk of injuries or fatalities to workers or members of the public. An example of this is the use of scaffolding and harnesses to safely work at heights or routine inspections on temporary construction electrical supplies by a qualified electrician to ensure they are in safe and good working order, or toolbox talks with the workforce to ensure focus and attention to safety is maintained. All these form part of our approach to managing health and safety on construction sites and the uncertainty and risk involved in construction activities. Let's now look at the broad range of strategies used to manage health and safety risks on construction projects. We will discuss the minimum controls that need to be in place to complete works, safe work method statements, the safety and design process, competencies and training, legislation, maintaining awareness, investigations, and reporting. The first and most important strategy that underlines everything we do in construction health and safety management are controls. Each construction activity we do has specific risks associated with it. For example, working at heights has specific risks like a person falling from height or dropping an object on somebody. Excavation has risks associated with it like striking an unknown gas or electricity pipe in the ground or a trench collapsing and burying somebody that is standing within it. To safely undertake any activity, the appropriate controls need to be in place to eliminate or minimize as far as reasonably practical the risk event from taking place. But how do we know the controls we have in place are sufficient to safely undertake the construction activity? We use the hierarchy of controls to categorize our controls and rank them from the highest levels of protection and reliability through to the lowest and least reliable forms of protection. The categories of controls are elimination, substitution, isolation, engineering, administrative, and PPE. These are ranked from most effective to least effective. An elimination control offers the highest level of protection and most effective control. It involves the complete physical removal of the hazard. Elimination controls can be more effectively implemented during the design and planning stage of the project. As an example, if we have the hazard of working at heights while installing lift fittings, an elimination solution would be to install the lift fittings at ground level and then stand the poles. In this way, the hazard of working at heights has been completely eliminated. If we are unable to eliminate the hazard, the next best control is to substitute the hazard with a safer option. For example, if our activity is excavation and the hazard is damage to in-ground gas or electricity services from an excavator, we could substitute this hazard by changing our construction methodology. We could use vacuum excavation, also known as non-destructive digging, to excavate without the risk of damaging services. There is still some risk of damaging services with vacuum excavation, however, it is significantly lower. Next, we can isolate the hazard. This means physically isolating people from the hazard rather than completely eliminating or substituting it. An example of an isolation control could be the use of concrete barriers to protect construction workers where works are taking place next to a live road. The concrete barriers isolate the workers and reduce the risk of being struck by oncoming traffic. An engineering control is where a system is put in place to engineer out the risk. These are not as effective as eliminating, substituting, or isolating. An example of an engineering control could be to put in place ventilation when working with dangerous chemicals. Administrative controls are work methods and procedures that are put in place to limit exposure to hazards. They are not considered a very effective control. An example of an administrative control could be using traffic signs or cones to warn people of a hazard. Nothing has actually been done to physically prevent interaction with the hazard other than requesting people behave a certain way. And finally, the lowest level of protection is the use of personal protective equipment, or PPE. This includes helmets, gloves, high-vis, and glasses. PPE is the last line of defense and by far the least effective form of protection. As an example, if we are performing work at heights and are trying to manage the hazard of dropped objects, a PPE solution would require workers to wear helmets. If an object falls, it will still hit a worker. They will just be wearing a helmet when it does. As you can imagine, this isn't an effective way to do things. As you can see, the hierarchy of controls provides a broad way of categorizing all our options for managing hazards. But how do we know what level of control is sufficient for an activity? As a minimum, all hazards should be managed with at least an engineering control. An activity cannot proceed if there are only administrative controls and PPE in place to manage hazards. In the industry, this is often referred to as having an above-the-line control in place where the line is drawn on the hierarchy of control above administrative. We use Safe Work Method Statements, or SWIMS, for short, 
to check and verify that all the hazards associated with an activity have been correctly identified and controlled. They are used to check that the minimum controls are in place for any high-risk construction activity. An example swims from WorkSafe Victoria is shown on screen. A swims basically consists of listing out all of the tasks involved in completing an activity, identifying the hazards with each task, listing the control measures, listing how the control measures will be implemented, and finally identifying who will be responsible for the implementation of the control. The template swims lists out the example of a high-risk work activity roof tiling. The hazard that's been identified is slipping or falling from the roof. The control measures are to use scaffold with a catch platform and guardrail system, and for workers to wear a fall restraint system such as a harness and appropriate anchor points. The control measures will be implemented by using scaffold or guardrail that is supplied and erected by a competent person and a fall restraint system installed and used by an appropriately trained person. The persons responsible are the principal contractor and roof workers. I'll attach an example copy of SWIMS to the course notes for you to review. A swim should be prepared by the person or persons conducting the works. As the head contractor, for any self-performed works, we will have to prepare our own swims. But for subcontractor works, we will simply review the subcontractor swims to check and verify that it meets the minimum requirements and all hazards are correctly identified and controlled. As a head contractor, we will have a swims checklist form and set of minimum controls for each activity in our company guidelines. The use of swims for all high-risk construction activities is a legislative requirement in Australia. Another important tool used to manage health and safety risks is the safety and design process. Safety and design is the integration of hazard identification and risk assessment methods early in the design process to eliminate or minimize the risks of injury throughout the life of the product being designed. In simpler terms, it's the process of continually asking how we can make this safer during the design process. The useful life of the asset that needs to be considered includes construction, operations, maintenance, and demolition. The safety and design process consists of a series of workshops during the design phase with representatives from all phases of the product life cycle. During these workshops, comments are raised after reviewing the initial project designs that need to be considered and addressed. These comments are recorded in the safety and design register. Through the phases of design development, these comments will be addressed and closed out. As a minimum, above-the-line controls are needed to address the comments so an engineering control or more has to be in place. In Australia, like having swims for key construction activities, the safety and design process is a legislative requirement. An important concept to understand that is the reason the safety and design process is so effective is that our ability to influence safety decreases as the project progresses through the project stages. It is much easier to eliminate a working at heights hazard during the planning than it is once construction has begun. For this reason, the safety and design process is an incredibly effective tool for eliminating and substituting hazards when it is easy to integrate change into the project. I've attached a copy to the course notes of an example safety and design register. Through the safety and design workshops, all the different hazards are identified and recorded by representatives from design, construction, maintenance, and asset users. The cause and existing controls are then scored in a risk assessment to determine the existing risk level. If this is considered too high, then a new control method has to be adopted that brings the risk down to an acceptable level. This control method could be adopted by the designer, contractor, or maintenance teams. As an example, during the safety and design process, a risk was identified that during the maintenance phase, maintainers would need access to the roof to inspect services, requiring working from heights. There was no existing controls in place to ensure this could be done safely. Therefore, the designers included safe maintenance access points where maintainers could attach harnesses in the design, thus addressing the risk and bringing the risk level down to an acceptable level. Another important control method used on construction projects to address health and safety risks are competencies and training. Competencies and training help ensure workers are skilled and capable of completing the job they have been allocated. Examples of this include using only electricians to complete electrical works and ensuring an excavator operator's competencies are sufficient to operate the plant he is using. Competencies and training can be project-specific, so ensuring all workers have completed a site induction and are familiar with the project they are working on, industry-specific. For example, on rail projects, workers typically have to undertake training specific to rail safety or job and task specific training, for example, checking that a truck driver has their heavy vehicle license. It is the role of the head contractor to ensure all these competencies for all workers are in place. While safety is an ethical responsibility, it is also important to acknowledge the role of legislation. Unlike legal issues with contracts and agreements, failure to provide a safe workplace and meet minimum safety obligations is a criminal offence. This means that if prosecuted, engineers and project managers can face huge fines and even jail time. We need to treat our obligations to meet safety requirements very seriously. Occupational Health and Safety, or OHS for short, standards must be met as a legal obligation. 
Things like the use of safe work method statements and following the safety and design process are legal requirements in Australia. In addition to this, specific rules and criteria around certain high-risk events are also legal obligations. For example, in the legislation, there are specific rules and guidelines around working in excavations deeper than 1.5 metres. Awareness is another important tool used to manage health and safety risks. Awareness helps to ensure that safety is at the forefront of everybody's mind and that a workplace culture with a focus on safety develops. This empowers workers to stop work if they feel unsafe. Examples of how this awareness and safety culture is developed include pre-starts, toolbox talks, and even company branding. Investigations are another useful tool to understand the root causes of events and incidents. When something goes wrong, an investigation helps to identify the root cause so we can prevent the same thing happening again, both on this project and other similar projects in the future. Investigations are not just about negative events. There can also be investigations to understand the positives so we can reproduce these behaviours in the future. Finally, reporting on key health and safety metrics is another tool used to manage this risk. This helps drive responsibility and accountability, but also provide important data to help identify lead indicators and trends that are developing. The type of statistics recorded include the number and type of reportable injuries, the number of LTIs or lost time injuries, and the TRIFR rate, which is the total reportable injury free rate. These metrics help paint a picture of how a project and company is performing in regards to safety. All in all, as a project engineer, safety is a critically important part of our job. Safety is our ethical responsibility, and we need to be ensuring works are performed in such a way that everybody is able to go home to their families.